All right, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for being with us uh, this morning. We're so grateful for your presence, as always. Thank you that you've made the right decision to come and worship God in spirit and in truth. And we're grateful to God that we have the opportunity to do so. So we have again behind me our continuing prayer list, uh, some people with updates that we did announce uh, Wednesday night, but I want to announce again because these are re more recent. Uh, as we said, Bobby Davis is, is having trouble with his uh, tear ducts, and, and so he's taking some medicine for that, some s stuff that he's got to rub in his eye. And so he's really having a lot of trouble reading and seeing things, and so let's pray for him that uh, he could get some help with that, get some relief that he'd be able to see a little bit better. Uh, Brenda Neal did have her upper uh, GI on Wednesday, and they discovered that she has stomach ulcers, and that's what's causing her liver issues. So I don't think it's cirrhosis of the liver, but that's what's causing the issues. But they do think they can do something about the ulcers, which would help restore her liver back to normal function. So that's good. So uh, hopefully that'll be good for her. But keep praying for her. Rosie, of course, has the blood pressure issues and the AFib issues, and uh, they are scheduling a heart cath. Did you all get that scheduled yet? Not yet still, so they're hoping to schedule a heart cath, and the doctor does think she has some kind of blockage. Uh, so let's pray for Rosie that the doctors will get on the stick and get something done and do something to help her uh, so she can feel better. Carlene Brown is Marisa's first cousin's wife. She has cancer, she's taking chemo, and she had stem cells infused into her blood, hoping that it would grow in the bone marrow. They expect this is gonna be a difficult process, so I assume we don't have any other update besides that, because I guess it'll take some time. But so Carlene Brown, remember her, because she, she's going through a difficult time with that. Uh, we also wanted to announce that uh, on Friday, our good sister, Keisha, uh, confessed to me that she had sin in her life and she repented of that. We went ahead and took care of it because like I told her, you don't want to wait. Uh, if you've got sin in your life, you need to take care of it. But we did want to make a public announcement. Uh, she wanted everybody to know that because we are commanded to publicly repent for things. And so we want to commend Keisha for that. Uh, I'm very proud of her for doing that. It takes courage. And a lot of people, they do things and then they refuse to repent. And I've, I've gone forward several times myself. And it's always intimidating, so I, I know how it is. But we've got to be right with God. And so she took care of that, and we're, we love her so much, and we're so proud of her. So congratulate her uh, after services are over. Uh, and then also want you to know that Brother Ralph has a birthday tomorrow. Okay, so congratulate him. He's... Tomorrow he won't be quite as young as he is today, so just let him know about that. But happy birthday, Ralph. We're grateful for that. Uh, Eastside's having a gospel meeting that begins today, goes through Wednesday night. Matt Wallen doing the preaching at 7 o'clock each night. Uh, Brother Maurice, you have our opening prayer, and then uh, Ralph, you have our dismissal prayer. And then last thing, uh, this, was, this was pretty awesome. Got this in the mail. Uh, the other day, uh, and I'll read it to you, and it's from uh, Wayne and Betty Word. It says, At Awa Church of Christ, please accept this donation in memory of our dear friend Jim Gain, and in honor of his precious wife, Rosella, and sweet daughter, Joy. Please acknowledge to the family receipt of this gift to your church in memory of Jim. Many thanks, Wayne and Betty Word. So uh, they did contribute money, and I put that in there, and I will give you ladies this card, and so you probably want to send them a thank you note. And, but I thought that was really, really sweet of these people uh, who apparently knew Jim and loved Jim and wanted to make a contribution in his name. So we greatly appreciate that. So that's all I have. We're going to turn the song service over to Brother Cheryl. And then again, Maurice and Ralph have the prayers. Morning, everyone. Morning. Please get your songbook and turn it under 472. Now, everybody's going to have to sing out on this. So, there's two parts to part of it. Yep. 
Please get your party song book to number 387. Let's sign this and prepare us to, to, to prepare us for the Lord's Prayer. Down at the cross for my Savior died. Down where for cleansing from sin I cried. There to my heart was a blood applied. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. First Corinthians 11 chapter beginning in verse 23 for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he break it and said take eat this is my body which is broken for you this do in remembrance of me after the same manner also he took the cup and when he had supped saying this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink. Drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Shall we pray? Father God, we come before your throne, thanking you, asking you to bless this bread that we're about to take. Taking this bread is a symbol to us of the broken body of your son upon the cross. And we thank you for that pain that he endured on our behalf. We ask this in your son's holy name. Amen. Shall we pray? Father, we come before your throne asking you to bless this fruit of the vine. This fruit of the vine to us represents the blood of your Son who bled freely upon that cross for us. We ask you to be with us as we take this symbol of your son's blood that we can remember the purpose of him giving that blood that we can have a hope of salvation through that blood if we follow his commandments go with us in all that we do help us to remember that this symbol represents the blood that was given 
pray that they make that decision that that blood is for them too. Go with us as we remember your son. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That concludes the Lord's Supper. I'm going to read 2 Corinthians ninth chapter verse 7 every man according as he purposed in his heart so let him give not grudgingly or of necessity for God loveth a cheerful giver let us pray Father we come before your throne again thanking you for the many blessings that you've blessed us with first we want to thank you for your son We thank you for the country that we live in that was based on biblical principles. We pray that those principles will be reconsidered in all the matters that are taken up by our leaders. And we, we pray that this country will continue to be free, that we can worship together. We thank you for the material blessings that you blessed us with. Help us to remember that these material blessings are not ours. They're your, really yours. Help us to give, as stated in the Bible, with a heart that is, that is concerned for others, concerned for their salvation, that, that words can be spoken and be heard and believed. Get your song book and turn to number 488. That sign dress before the Lord.
Nine six. Number six times six will be the song invitation. I have to do it. Once you've marked your uh, song, if you would be turning in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Are you totally dedicated to God? That's a question that you need to ask yourself, and I do too. Do you truly live your life for Him to the best of your ability? That doesn't mean we're perfect and we never make a mistake, but are you striving every day to live for Him? Because the way we live our lives, the way we conduct ourselves, it says a lot about whether or not we can truly be called Christians. I mean, we can call ourselves that, but can we truly be considered to be Christian? Would God consider me to be a Christian? Would he consider you to be a Christian? Those are questions that we need to ask ourselves as we think about our human existence here on earth. It's, it's really framed by three categories of things. We talk about our, our thoughts, our words, and our deeds. And really, everything that we do is, is framed in those three categories, our thoughts, our words, and our deeds. Now, ask yourself, are these things in your life are they governed by godly principles? These things in my life, can I honestly say they are governed by godly principles? I need to know the answer to that question for myself, and you need to know it for yourselves. Because they should be, in fact, I would argue they must be, if you desire to please God, and if you desire... To go to heaven and I assume you do or you wouldn't be here this morning so those are questions that we need to answer if we want to get to heaven someday so we want to first notice how Paul instructed us to live in Colossians 3 in verse 17 a well-known verse for a lot of people how did Paul instruct us to live well notice what he says and whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. So notice Paul didn't say do some things or most things or half the things. Whatsoever you do, do all in the name of the Lord. Every single thing needs to be in the name of Jesus. In other words, in the authority of of Jesus, meaning that we must obey, we must do those things in our daily lives that are pleasing unto God. And we know what those things are because God has given us his word. Now, we've often talked about how God's word, of course, guides us in how we conduct ourselves in the worship service. There are certain things we do, there are certain things we don't do. Because God has said, I want my worship service to be this way and this way and this way. And that's what we do. But we also got to remember that this book guides not only what we do in the worship service, but it better be guiding every single thing we do when we set foot outside of this building. When we interact with an evil and sinful world. It needs to govern our behavior. If we want, again, if we want to be pleasing unto God. Now remember, if you'll turn over to Revelation chapter 3, we studied a, a few months ago, the, we looked at the seven letters to the seven churches in Asia where Jesus either praised them or rebuked them or some of both. Well, in Revelation chapter 3, we see the last of those seven churches, the last seven letters. This was the church at Laodicea. 
And it was the one out of the seven that Jesus had nothing good to say about. He gave no praise at all to Laodicea. He only had condemnation for them. And we notice, among other things here, that Jesus will not accept part-time Christians. What I sometimes call Sunday morning Christians. All right? So I, I'm going to be a good Christian. I'm going to go to church on Sunday, but then the rest of the week you can't tell me from anybody else. Well, Jesus will not accept that. Revelation 3, beginning in verse 15, talking to the, the Christians, so-called Christians, at Laodicea. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Okay? It's not good enough to be a Christian some of the time. Just when we come to church, or maybe even some of the time out there, Jesus makes it clear that you're either with me or you're against me. So figuratively speaking, we can't live our lives with one foot in the church door and the other foot out in the world, straddling the fence, as it were. We cannot do that. Jesus makes that plain here. You're either with me or you're against me. Pick a side. And we're all going to pick a side, either deliberately or inadvertently. So today, we want to examine, well, what does it mean to do all in the name of the Lord each and every day of our life? We, we said that Paul told us that's what we have to do, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Well, what does that mean? So we want to consider those three aspects of our life this morning. We want to take a look at our thoughts, our words, and our actions. So first of all, let's take a look at the mental aspect of it, our thoughts. What are we thinking? How should we be thinking to do all in the name of the Lord, which Paul instructed us to do? Well, we must be constantly guarding our thoughts. And I do mean constantly. It's a daily, hourly, minute by minute, we need to be in charge of our thoughts and not let them be in charge of us and run away from us in areas we don't need to be going to. Turn over to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. We need to be guarding our thoughts. We need to be controlling what we are thinking. Because we are clearly told in the Bible that evil deeds begin with evil thoughts. We talk about in our heart and we understand Jesus is not talking about the blood pump in our chest. By any time you see in the Bible says this is in your heart or it should be in your it's talking about the mind, what we're thinking. So look at Mark chapter 7 beginning in verse 20. And he being Jesus said, that which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, again, the brain, the mind, what we're thinking, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. It's a pretty bad list there. Verse 23, all these evil things come from within and defile the man. So Jesus said, all of these horrible, evil, sinful actions and activities and behaviors that people do, they all start right here. People think about it and then they do it. Okay? Evil thoughts lead to evil actions. That's what Jesus is telling us here. Now, we want to notice also, if you'll turn over to Matthew chapter 5, that we can even sin by dwelling on evil thoughts, even though we don't actually commit the evil act. And we're, and we're going to clarify, what do we mean by that? Well, look at Matthew chapter 5. Again, Jesus speaking here, verse, verses 27 and 28. 
Jesus said, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And again, the heart is the mind. Okay, well, Lord, what are you saying here? Well, if we look upon somebody, if a man who looks upon a woman who's not his wife or a woman looks upon a man who is not her husband and we desire that person, we start to have those kind of thoughts. Wow, she looks great. Or, or he's awfully handsome, whatever it is. We start to have those thoughts that if we dwell on that, Jesus said we have already committed sin in our mind. We may, it may be uh, someone on TV, an actor or an actress, that maybe there's a beautiful actress on TV and I see her. I'm never going to see that woman in person. I would never actually commit adultery with her physically. But what Jesus is saying here, that if I continually dwell on this woman instead of my wife, and I'm, I'm always thinking about this actress, he's saying, I'm committing sin in my mind. And that's just as much of a sin as if I actually committed the act. Now, people will say, well, wait a minute. I mean, sometimes you, you can't control them, and those thoughts just pop into your head. And that's true. And a lot of you would agree, I'm sure, that sometimes there are bad thoughts. Maybe there's somebody you really don't like. Yeah, I'd like to kill that guy. You know, I'd really like to just take a gun and shoot him. And those are evil thoughts. Maybe you wouldn't ever actually go do it. But what he's saying is that if we're dwelling on that, if we let that fester in our head, that in itself becomes a sin. We don't actually have to do the action. Obviously, the action itself would be a sin as well if we carried it that far. Now, why would Jesus tell us that? Well, I mean, why would he care what we're thinking? Well, because like he said, often those thoughts lead to the actions. It may not always lead to the action. But if I'm never thinking about killing my neighbor, I'm probably not going to kill him. If I realize that those are bad thoughts, I got to put that out of my mind. Or if I'm thinking about some beautiful woman, yeah, I, I got to put that out of my mind. So what he's telling us here is if that thought creeps in, we need to immediately push it back out. Don't let it sit in there and marinate, right? Because that leads to worse and worse things. And so if we just continually dwell on that, that is sinful behavior. Now, as I said, we've got to push those things out. Well, what are we to replace it with? We've got to be thinking about something. Well, turn over to Philippians chapter 4, and we want to see here what we're told that we ought to be thinking about. Okay? And it goes back again, as I've often told you all, to, again, this idea of part-time Christians, right? If, if you or I, if the only time we ever open our Bible is when we walk in here, Monday, Tuesday, okay, I'll give, it, I'll give God another hour on Wednesday night. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, never look at my Bible, never pray. Never, you know, God's not really on my mind. That leads me into areas I shouldn't be going into. But if I've continually got God on my mind and pure things, righteous things, that's going to help me to keep those bad things out. And that's what we're supposed to do. Look at Philippians 4, beginning in verse 7. We need to strive to keep our thoughts pure. And nobody said that was easy. Sometimes it's hard. But that's what we got to try to do. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, again, he's talking to Christians here, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. That's where my thoughts are supposed to be. Not on evil things, but I need to be thinking on good things continually. And the idea, again, the more I study the Bible, the more I get on my knees and pray to God, the more time I spend with Him, the less likely I am to think about those worldly things. The further I get away from God, the more worldly I become. And I don't have these pure thoughts. I'm going to have the sinful thoughts. 
which is only going to lead me in a bad direction that I don't want to go in. So that's what God is telling us, right? So to live for Jesus, to live as a Christian, we need to guard our thoughts. We need to be thinking on the things that God told us to be thinking on. Secondly, what about verbalization? What about our words? The things that we say. We must only speak in ways that are pleasing unto God. That is, if we want to get to heaven, and we all do, so I said that's why we're here. So many people claim to be Christians, and they might even believe it. I'm not even saying they're lying. They, they may think that. Well, yeah, I'm a, I'm a good Christian, and I, I come to church on Sunday, and I, I sing the songs, and you know. But then on Monday, they're out here cussing out their neighbor. Your dog dug up my flowers. Why are you sorry? You know. But weren't you in church yesterday? Well, yeah, that's, yeah, that's Sunday. I, I didn't, I didn't cuss in church, but it's okay to cuss out here. No, it isn't. Right? We've got to watch what we say. And I've told y'all this story. I, you know, there were plenty of students I had that I would always have them write an autobiography, and a lot of them would talk in their autobiography about, oh, I love Jesus, I love the Lord, and I live my life for Him, and then. Not 10 minutes after they wrote the autobiography, I'd hear them out in the hall cussing like a sailor. You're living for Christ? Really? You think Jesus would be okay with that language? Of course he wouldn't. But, you know, in, in their mind, they think that's, that's okay. Well, we have to watch what we say. We don't want to be just like everybody else. If people, by, if, if somebody runs into me at the mall or at the ballpark or whatever, and I'm talking just like everybody else, they wouldn't be able to tell that I'm a Christian. And in a way, that's a good thing. Right? Because if I claim to be a Christian, and then I act like everybody else, I mean, well, it doesn't mean much to be a Christian, does it? I would bring reproach on Christ and on the church if I were to do that. So maybe it's better they don't know. But the idea is they ought to be able to tell the difference in us. So, you know, he, he doesn't sound like everybody else. She doesn't sound like everybody else. There ought to be a noticeable difference. The church is the called out. We're not supposed to be just like everybody else. We must not speak harshly to hurt people. Now, if somebody has sinned, then yeah, we've got to call that out. But even there, you know, you can try to do it in a nice way, right? But just to, you know, a lot of people, they like to say things just to hurt people. Now, we've all heard that phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Now, is that true? not been for me. I can tell you from personal experience, there's been plenty of people that have hurt me deeply by things they've said to me or about me. And I can pretty much guarantee you that I've said hurtful things that have hurt other people too. Words do hurt. You know, sticks and stones may break your bones, but words wound us very deeply. So we cannot speak harshly to hurt people. We cannot use foul language. We cannot tell dirty jokes just because we think they're funny. We can't be doing those kind of things. There are a lot of verses in the Bible that warn us about this. I've got one up there right now, Matthew 12, 37. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Okay? We are most definitely being judged by other things as well, but God is saying one of the things I'm judging you by is your mouth. Are you speaking as a Christian should speak? Or are you speaking like the heathens in the world? And we will be held accountable for that, most assuredly. A lot of verses in the Bible. Let's look at just a few of them. Look at Psalm 141 and verse 3. I think you will see clearly what God is trying to instruct us about how we use our mouth, how we use our words to communicate. Psalm 141 and verse 3. Notice what the psalmist is praying to God for. Set a watch, O Lord. And this means like a guard. They, they called him a watch back then. They put soldiers on guard. This man is standing watch. Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. We all need to pray for that. So he's praying, said, Lord, please help me to think before I speak. 
And there have been so many times in my life, and you may be able to say the same thing about you, that almost as soon as I said something, oh, I didn't say that out loud, did I? Did I just say that, you know? And sometimes I can tell that by the way my wife is looking at me. Or she's, oh, what? <laughs> and you want to, oh, you'd give anything if you could pull it back. But that fish has done left the boat. You're not going to be able to reel that back in. Right? And you can, yep, yeah, oh, I'm so sorry. I, yeah, you can say you're sorry, but the hurt is still there. Right? So we need, he's praying to please watch the door of my lips. Lord, help me to think carefully before I speak. Too many of us, again, me included, I've done it many a time, we speak before we think. It's the first thing that comes to your mind. You just blurt that out. Well, maybe that's not the best thing to say. And maybe it's not the best thing to be thinking. That goes back to the first point, right? Monitor your thoughts. And then monitor what comes out of those thoughts. Right? So he's praying for that. Lord, help me to not say the wrong things. And we need God's help for that. Look at Proverbs 15. Stay in there in the Old Testament. Proverbs 15. Proverbs, great book, of course, for advice about the things we should and should not do. Proverbs chapter 15, the first two verses. God says, a soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. The tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. Okay, telling us here that your words can do a lot of damage. They can also do a lot of good. Okay, you can encourage people. You can lift people up. You can bring people to Christ with your words. But we can also run people away with our words. Well, they will never darken the doors of the church ever again because somebody said something that flew all over them. And we can argue all day, well, well, they ought to get past that. Well, you're right, they should, but some people don't. So again, the idea is be very, very careful well, we want to encourage people. We want to build people up. Above all, we want to build, bring people to Christ. And we can do that with our words, but we can also turn them away. And we don't want to do that. We want to, again, we want people to notice in our speech, hey, he or she, that, that person's different. They don't, they don't talk like everybody. They don't say things like everybody. They're not hurtful to everybody like everybody else. We want people to notice a difference. Because maybe they'll ask us, why, why are you like that? Well, well, let me tell you about the Lord. Let me tell you about Christ. That's why I'm the way I am. And I've had plenty of examples, either me or people I've known, where that actually happens. It, it may take a little while, but people eventually ask them, say, you know, I've noticed you just, you don't ever, why, why don't you, you know, you don't laugh, but we tell dirty jokes and you walk out of the room. And why is that? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you. That may open doors for you. So we want them to see that there's a difference in us. Look to, go to the New Testament. Look at Matthew 15 and verse 11. This is very similar to what we just read in Mark 7, where Jesus is expressing the same thought here. Matthew 15 and 11. Jesus said, Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth this defileth the man. There were, you know, restrictions under the old law. You couldn't eat certain foods because they were considered unclean. And Jesus is telling you, it's not really, there's a new covenant. And it's not about that. What you put in is really not that important. It's what comes out. And it's not the food that comes out of your mouth. It's the words that come out of your mouth, which again originate in the mind. Okay? So once again, going back to if we keep our thoughts pure, our language is most likely it's going to follow suit and it's going to be pure as well. And so they, they go together. We'll look at Ephesians chapter 4. We'll look at a couple of verses in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Notice what we're told here. Ephesians 4, 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Again, our words can hurt 
for our words can bring tremendous blessings to people. The choice is ours. What are we going to do with it? But notice that he said, no corrupt communication. Well, I'm sure you, a, a little's okay, right? I mean, I, maybe one day a week I can say whatever. No corrupt communication. None. Zero. And if we do, then we need to repent of that. We need to fix it. Right? That's what he's telling us. Because, again, we can help people or we can hurt people. We can help or hurt ourselves based on what we're saying. We'll stay there in Ephesians. Look at the next chapter, chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. Beginning there in verse 3, it says, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saint. Again, it's talking about Christians. Now, notice verse 4. What else? Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. And so again, he's talking about don't let any of these bad things come out of you. And that includes filthiness, foolish talking, jesting, all these things you do with your mouth. If you're one of the saints, if you're a Christian, you cannot let those things come out of your mouth. You may be tempted, but you need to bite your tongue and then get that thought out of your brain as quick as you can. That's what we're supposed to do. Now, let's address it. it jesting, you mean, it, is God really telling us we can't ever tell a joke? We can't kid around with our friends? Is that what that means? Because jesting is joking. Is that what he's talking about? No, again, you've got to put it into context. Filthiness, foolish talking, nor jesting. Well, he's not talking about, you know, we can kind of kid our friends. He's talking about dirty jokes, doing something that's filthy and vile. Yeah, you don't need to be joking about stuff like that. But there are such a thing as harmless jokes. I don't know how you get through life without a sense of humor. I really don't. I'm convinced God has a sense of humor. Just look at the platypus. God has a sense of humor. Right? Who would have thought, I'm going to make this thing, right? So he does. I think it's fine. We need laughter. We need joy. And God brings that. But also we can give it to each other. And sometimes, you know, kidding around with each other, that's... That's a good thing, right? So what he's talking about here is, yeah, don't take that into the evil areas. Don't take that into a place that God would not be pleased with. By all means, you can joke around, but let's keep it clean is what he's saying here. Well, let's look at one more. James 3, verses 8 through 10. James 3, verses 8 through 10. Notice what the Bible says here. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil. Full of deadly poison. Now notice this. This is kind of what we were talking about earlier. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. So again, the idea of on Sunday, I'm in here, I'm praising God, I'm praying to God, I'm singing songs to God, and then tomorrow I'm going to cuss out my neighbor. And it says, look, people, you and me and everybody else are made in the similitude of God. In other words, we're made in the image of God. So you're cussing out one of God's creatures. That's what he's saying. So don't do that. Again, somebody's sinning against you, yeah, you can call them out for it, but there's a way to do that. Not calling him every name in the book that you can't repeat, right? If Jesus were standing next to you, would you be talking like that? Probably not. And the thing is, he is. He hears everything. He knows everything, right? So we've we got to remember that. So why do you think there are so many warnings against this? Because it's a real problem for a lot of people, and we need to pay attention to that. Well, finally this morning, what about the application. What about our actions, the, the things that we do? So we talk about thoughts, talk about words. What do we do? Well, good thoughts and good words are essential, but they're not enough. We also have to have good deeds, and the good thoughts and good words should lead to good deeds. All these things go hand in hand together. Believing in and loving Jesus means living for him. Again, not just talking a good game, but we're living our life through the actions. Okay, look at Matthew 23. 
We want to practice what we preach. Practice what we preach. Well, you, you talk a good game about being a follower of Christ, but then if you don't act like it, you're not really a follower of Christ. Okay, so we don't want to be hypocrites like the Pharisees because they didn't practice what they preached. They claimed to be righteous, but they certainly didn't always live that way. And again, Jesus rebukes them for that, Matthew 23, beginning in verse 2, saying, the scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, all therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. If they tell you the right thing that Moses in the law, yeah, go ahead and do that. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. They're hypocrites. They don't practice what they preach. They talk a good game, but they don't live it. Okay? We don't want to be like that. Notice what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 31. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 31. Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Eating, drinking, going to the mall, going to the ballpark, going to work, whatever it is we're doing, do all for not for my glory, but for the glory of God. Okay, look at 1 Peter 2, verse 21. Notice what Peter, what instruction that Peter gave us. He said, For even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. We, if we want to be Christ-like, we have to act like Christ. Now, you and I can't heal the sick. We know that. But have the character that Jesus had. He never committed a sin. He never wanted to hurt anybody. He was always trying to help people. Even when he called out the Pharisees, he's trying to help people by calling out the error of their ways. So we need to act like Jesus. Last one, Matthew 7, verses 16 and 17, or sorry, Luke 6, 40. About to skip that one. Luke 6, 40. What did Jesus say? So the disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. And perfect again means mature, complete in the faith. It doesn't mean without mistake. But he said, you'll be like your master. We are to be Christ-like, live like him. And then now the last one, Matthew 7, 16 and 17. Remember what Jesus said about people's actions. He said, ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. We will be known by our fruits, by our works, by how we behave. And we need to be Christ-like. So let us strive every day to live for Christ with total, complete dedication to him. We opened with Colossians 3.17, which said, whatsoever you do, do all in the name of the Lord, right? So let us do all that we can to make sure that everything we think, everything we say, and everything we do is done for the glory of God. And may God help us to rededicate our lives to him. This morning, if you're not a Christian, you need to be a Christian because God has commanded you to do that. You need to dedicate your life to God, and we can help you do that. We can baptize you into Christ, and God will add you to his church. If you have a need this morning, we hope you'll do that. If, on the other hand, you are a Christian, but you've fallen away and you've sinned against God, you need to make public confession of that. We can pray with you and for you, and God has promised he will forgive you. So if you have a need to become a Christian this morning or to be restored, please come forward as together we stand and we sing. There's a fountain free just for you and me. Let us haste the place to its brink. There's a fountain of love from the source of love. And he bids us all freely Will you come to the fountain free? Will you come? Tis for you and me. Thirsty soul, hear the welcome call. Tis a fountain open for all. There's a living stream with a crystal clean from the throne of Will you 
See you all back tonight at six. Well, again, we thank Brother Mark again for another good lesson this morning. We always need to thank He. Always remember those that are on our sick list. Always cherish each and every one that's lost someone in their lives that they love. Please remember Thursday tonight at six o'clock. Thursday, Wednesday night at six o'clock. And I will be Bible study Sunday morning at 9 30, labor services at 10 30. We all need to be here. Please turn your song books to number 525. Let's sing the first verse of this and we'll have our closing prayer. <clears throat> if we walk in the path, 